Welcome to this uh, BioExcel Winter School short talk about uh, using Gromax and PMX with the BioExcel Building Blocks Library to tackle a particular COVID-19 research project. My name is Adam Hospital. You already know me from the BioExcel Building Blocks uh, lectures in this uh, BioExcel Winter School. Let me start with a really brief one slide introduction on Gromax PMX and the workflows that we build uh, with the BioExcel Building Blocks library. Uh, and now you already know all of that because uh, you've been um, attending all the lectures in this uh, BioExcel Winter School, but uh, Gromax and uh, PMX are two of our key applications in BioExcel. We are using Gromax to uh, compute molecular dynamic simulations and we are using PMX to compute free energy calculations. Uh, and we are in BioExcel using the BioExcel building blocks to uh, build workflows using these uh, two biomolecular simulation tools, but uh, many other biomolecular, biomolecular simulation tools together, thanks to this interoperability that the library is offering. Uh, and we are executing and controlling the workflows using different workflow managers. And in this case, in this particular example, I will uh, present you results using the PyCom's workflow manager, which is being developed at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center and is HPC focused, you will see. So uh, this project started uh, when the pandemic uh, appeared. And uh, at the moment, many different groups uh, in the biomolecular simulation field started to uh, be interested in the COVID-19 infection mechanism on how SARS-CoV-2 was able to infect uh, the human cells. And uh, I'm sure that you all uh, recognize these, uh, these pictures from this slide. But just as a reminder, this is the <clears throat> SARS-CoV-2 virus. These red protuberances that you see here are the spike proteins. And these spike proteins are the one that uh, attaches to the uh, human or the host cell and they are doing that using uh, this protein, green protein represented here, which is the receptor binding domain protein from the virus, uh, RBD, uh, which is attaching this uh, human H2, the angiotensin uh, converting enzyme 2 uh, from the human cell. Uh, here, an schematic representation on the uh, H2 receptor and the RBD here in green. And what we are interested in is just this interface between both protein, so the interface that, is, uh, 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 that makes the virus uh, able to recognize uh, the protein and to make the infection. So we are interested in this green, uh, sorry, yellow interface here, highlighted interface from the RBD, but uh, also from this interface of, of uh, the human ACE2 uh, protein. And what we are interested in are, uh, in particular, the mutations on this uh, interface. How? Uh, uh, this uh, RBD, for example, interface is mutating, how these mutations are affecting in the infection uh, of the virus to the human cells, and also the polymorphisms uh, in this human ACE2 uh, protein affects the infection from the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus. And this is the first um, part of uh, more ambitious uh, objectives of the project. The second phase of the project was to uh, go from just the SARS-CoV-2 virus to different variants of the virus. So for example, the SARS, the, the previous virus that uh, uh, appeared in 2003 and affected the human population, but also variants of the current virus, such as the virus, such as the uh, American variant, or why not uh, different species? This one is the um, virus which is affecting the bat uh, species. And we are interested in uh, understanding what are the mutations uh, uh, coming from the bat virus, this one, the one affecting the bat, to the SARS-CoV-2, the one that is affecting us. And so how did the virus evolve? Uh, what mutations appeared in the uh, going from one species to another? And how are these mutations affecting in the infection? And finally, and the most ambitious phase of the project, we want to go and take a look at different species, many different species, pangolin, um, uh, Zibelin, uh, the bat, the human, and uh, different variants of the virus, but also different variants of the ACE2 protein, which is the one that the virus is recognizing in the, in the different uh, species. So as you can see, this is a very ambitious project when we want to compute the differences um, on binding of this RBD and the human ACE2 or ACE2 from different species using this uh, 
uh, workflows, biomolecular simulation workflows. So what we are interested in is um, to take a look at the variants uh, of the different viruses and the infectivity of these variants, the difference on the infectivity. Uh, if we could identify mutations that are increasing this infectivity and how are these mutations affecting uh, these infections, where are they placed, why they are affecting so much uh, uh, the infection or the binding uh, between both proteins. And the final objective is uh, if can we predict the future evolution. That means uh, with all the information gathered together here, can we uh, start taking, uh, seeing or predicting if a particular mutation will increase the infectivity and if this uh, seeing uh, the, if this mutation is already there or it could be there in the near future. As you can see, this is a combinatorial explosion, so it is really a complicated project with many different um, combinations to compute, and you will see in this uh, uh, presentation how are we uh, planning to tackle this combinatorial explosion, basically using HPC resources uh, with many different cores, actually supercomputers. So how are we predicting the effect of the protein mutations in this uh, RBD uh, ACE2 complex binding? Uh, we are using that, we are doing that using this thermodynamic cycle. I'm not going to enter into details here. I'm sure that we, that you already recognize this kind of cycle. Uh, you've, uh, you have attended the PMX uh, different lectures, so you may also uh, see this slide there. Uh, but basically what we, are interested in, in to extract relative protein binding free energy differences, and we are doing that, that using alchemical free energy uh, method. Uh, and what we need to extract this delta delta G is to compute these two delta Gs here, the one and the four. The one is coming from a monomer RBD if we are interested in mutations on the RBD, or ACE2 if we are interested in mutations on the ACE2 uh, from the wild type to the mutated uh, structure. And we are doing the same with the complex RBDase2 with the same mutations. We are going from the complex wild type to the complex uh, with the mutations. We are extracting these two delta Gs and subtracting both values. We obtain the final delta delta G, which is giving us information about uh, if these mutations is, is affecting uh, the binding of the, uh, these two different um, proteins, RBD and ACE2. Uh, in a more technical, uh, detailed uh, slide, and this is exactly what we built in our workflow, we to uh, compute two delta Gs, delta G1 and delta G4, we need uh, to compute first four different equilibrium molecular dynamic simulations, one for the RBD wild type, one for the RBD with mutations, one for the complex RBD humanase wild type, and another for the complex RBD humanase with the mutation. So with this, equilibrium molecular dynamics going from nanoseconds to microseconds, then we extract a number of uh, snapshots, an ensemble of uh, structures, in our case 500 different structures, and we compute thermodynamic integrations going from state A to state B, from the wild type to the mutations. And then we are doing the same uh, in reverse, from state B to state A. In total, 1,000 different short molecular dynamic simulations, thermodynamic integrations from 10 picoseconds to 200 picoseconds, where we are doing that uh, in the monomeric structure and we are doing that also in the complex structure. We obtain the two different delta Gs and finally, subtracting both values, we obtain the delta delta G. All of this information, it was really nicely explained by Betas in, this, in the chapter of this book that you have here. And you have also attended the PMX uh, lecture, so maybe you already know all of that. And this is the final diagram of the project. Uh, and remember, this is our combinatorial uh, combination, the combinatorial explosion that uh, I was telling you before, a really complex and ambitious project. But uh, we have divided this uh, project in two um, that basically are our workflows. The first one generating the molecular dynamics, the equilibrium molecular dynamics, and the second one from this molecular dynamics um, computing the fast growth thermodynamic integration and obtaining the delta delta G values. Of course, all of this uh, needs praise resources, praise computational power, and we are using supercomputers such as the Mare Nostrum one that we have in the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. But, how are we uh, taking advantage of these uh, resources? Uh, we do that going exascale, and we are doing that using the PyComs Workflow Manager. PyComs Workflow Manager is, uh, I was 
as I was telling you in the first slide, is developed in the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. It is basically a tool that it's uh, able to identify from our um, Python coded uh, workflows. Uh, it is able to identify uh, these loops which have uh, completely independent branches and it is uh, able to automatically identify these independent branches and run them, execute them in parallel. So these branches are executed in parallel and uh, thanks to the fault tolerance, if one of the uh, branches crashes, the rest of the branches still reaches the end of the workflow. So we uh, have only um, we will only need to take a look at this branch that has uh, crashed and the other ones will give us the results. And it is also uh, using an efficient, uh, it's efficiently used using uh, the CPUs of the uh, different nodes on the supercomputers, as you can see here. And you will see that in another slide. Uh, remember the diagram, we have two different workflows. The first one for generating the molecular dynamics um, trajectory is the second one to compute uh, the free energy simulation. So the first one, uh, we have an automated uh, modeling of all the mutations, the setup process and the production run of the MD simulations with different parameters that we can change, of course, in an MPI regime. As an example, we can run in one particular job, in one single job, using more than 8,000 different cores of the uh, supercomputer, 22 mutations, 21 mutations, plus the wild type. Uh, and we can run that in hours. From these simulations, we can run then the free energy calculations using the second workflow. And this workflow is uh, uh, extracting the ensemble of the structures from the equilibrium dynamics uh, that we have generated with the first one. And for each of these uh, snapshots, it is generating the hybrid topology using PMX. Uh, and it is running the thermodynamic integration using Gromax. All the work values computed for all the snapshots are then integrated together to extract the final delta G. Remember, this is one delta G, just one. We need to run twice this workflow to extract two delta Gs, one for the monomer, one for the complex, and then obtain the delta delta G uh, on the mutations, on just one mutation. Uh, as an example, we can use 32 nodes, more than 1,500 cores in one single job, and that means that we, in five hours, we are able to compute one of these uh, delta Gs. Uh, an example, this particular example uh, that I was uh, showing you in the previous slide, uh, using 32 different nodes, you can see here how PyComs is able to use these 32 nodes uh, with 100% of CPU usage and just the green line, which is the node reserve to orchestrate the whole workflow is the one that is not using all uh, the CPUs. And this is, remember, 1,000 different thermodynamic integrations using uh, a supercomputer. So preliminary results using all of these workflows, uh, starting from the human polymorphisms, uh, you can see here on the right hand that, uh, for example, if we identify with the workflows a mutation which is giving more infectivity to the virus, that the, the lower the number, the more infectivity the virus have. Um, if you look at the, the frequency of these mutations, you can see that this is really uh, uh, appearing in the, in, the in the human population. It has a higher frequency of appearing in the human population, whereas the other ones, for example, these ones which are given uh, lower <clears throat> infectivity to the virus, they are appearing in uh, less number of, uh, of people for the human population. So the virus, in a way, has already adapted to the human polymorphisms that are present in many uh, uh, people uh, as of today. If we look at the virus uh, variations, and we look again at the column of the PMX results, if we look at the ones that are giving the mutations that are giving more infectivity, and then we look at the frequency of these mutations, you can see again that once uh, the mutations that are giving more infectivity has higher frequency. Uh, so that means that the, the, uh, as this mutation is giving more infectivity, the virus has kept this mutation and this is evolving towards having more infectivity. Whereas if we look at the, these uh, mutations that are giving less infectivity to the virus, we can see that the frequency is uh, really uh, lower than the others. If we look at something more complex, which is the, um, uh, the, the different mutations 
to go from the bat, uh, the virus affecting bat to the virus affecting human, so the rat G13 to the SARS-CoV-2. Uh, there's 21 different mutations coming from the, to go from this uh, rat G13 to this SARS-CoV-2. And if you see, there's uh, blue and red boxes. That means that are, these mutations are uh, charge changing, that they are introducing a charge or removing a charge, lysines, arginines, uh, glutamic acids or aspartic acids. And if you look at the mutations to go from uh, the ACE2 of the bat species to the ACE2 of the human species, you can see more or less the same trend. There's a lot of red and blue boxes, so a lot of different electrostatics uh, changing between the different species. And actually, if we paint the interface of the bat uh, virus versus the human virus, you can see also that there is a high redistribution of the electrostatic potential on the interface of the RBD uh, and the uh, ACE2. So that is giving the SARS-CoV-2 higher infectivity and also is giving higher flexibility to be able to infect not just the human ACE2, but also different uh, ACE2 from different species. Uh, this is just a final slide uh, with examples on uh, chart changing mutations, the PMX running the workflow and extracting the delta TLTG values. And you can see how the sum of the different chart changing mutations uh, uh, in total are giving more infectivity to uh, the virus or SARS CoV 2. Just using the chart changing mutations is uh, gaining 5K cal of infectivity. And uh, now we are taking a look at these uh, higher numbers, the ones in red, which, which are giving a lot of infectivity, and also the ones that are uh, removing part of the infectivity. And we have confirmed all of these numbers by slow growth thermodynamic integration, something more um, um, computationally expensive, that is fast growth, even more expensive, PMFs, and also we are confirming that with experimental results. We have a collaboration with an Italian group that are confirming all of this with experimental results. And uh, finally, uh, um, please remind that this is a really ambitious project. We have concentrated in this short talk in just one particular uh, virus variant from the bat to the human, but we are now exploring all the different variants. And so if you are interested in that, uh, please keep an eye on the BioXL um, website and also on our Twitter. Uh, and, and thanks uh, for your attention. And I, if you have questions, I would be happy to answer them now.